Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. Something like 43,000 people died in automobile accidents in the United States last year alone. For reasons that experts still can't agree on, auto accidents are up significantly since the COVID-19 pandemic set in. And globally, cars are the number one killer of young people under the age of 30. Moreover, internal combustion powered vehicles are clearly bad news for the environment. While many people hold out a lot of hope for electric vehicles, that technology isn't a magic bullet. There are lots of systemic problems with EVs, as I discussed in the podcast interview with Aaron Gordon, and hope to cover more in future episodes. And yet, for some reason, criticizing or even honestly addressing the irrationality of America's dependence on the automobile is off the table, both in mass media and in public policy. In most places, going after cars is a wonderful way for U.S. politicians to make sure they don't get reelected next cycle. And yet, reforming our transportation system is really, really important, especially for climate change, but not only for that reason. It's also important for reasons of livability and decreasing death and injury. Now, one way to break this open is to talk about bicycles. And the idea isn't that everyone's going to start using bikes to get around. That's ridiculous and isn't going to happen. No, the better place to start is by pointing out how few Americans use bicycles as transportation. Only about 1% of Americans use bikes regularly as transportation, and only half that number use them to commute. This contrasts with, for example, famously, the Dutch, about 27% of whom use bikes to get around. But at least at one point in time, even people up by the North Pole in Canada use bikes as transportation more often than Americans do. Following bikes is a good method to split open the U.S. transportation system and think through how it has come to be what it is. For this reason, I was really excited to talk with Zach Furness, an associate professor of communications at Penn State Greater Allegheny, about his 2010 book, one less car, bicycling, and the politics of automobility. Zach not only lays out the story of how automobiles came to dominate American culture, but also tells the really fascinating story of how subcultures and countercultures formed around the bicycle and used it as a tool to critique what Zach calls the automobile industrial complex. I had a lot of fun chatting with Zach as you'll see, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun hearing about him and his work. Get excited! Zach! Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate you having me on, uh, especially because when I first got in touch with you, it was because I was using uh, an interview with Ruth Schwartz Cohen that you did on your show, and uh, it worked out really perfectly to assign to my students, and I've been loving the podcast since then. So That's great, man. Well, thanks. I mean, I've uh, we're going to talk about your... Um, your book here in a second, but I've I've wanted to have someone on to talk about bicycles and cars for a long time because I think it's a really important topic for our future. So uh, when I learned about your book, it was it was a great opportunity. So, you know, one less car is is a cool book. So when when you explain it to people, what it's about, what do you say? What were you trying to do with it? The main thing I was trying to do was really try to provide the most 
at least at that point, the most comprehensive view of how people have politicized cycling mm -hmm. um, and used the bike as an instrument of political critique and, you know, as well as obviously being a vehicle, something for fun, for pleasure. Um, but in particular, thinking about the ways that people had taken their experiences as cyclists and their ideas about what it meant to ride and use that as a framework to think about all these other issues about urban planning and city architecture and the right to the city, um, about technology itself and people's ability to access it or change it and tweak it. Um, and I really wanted to take all of these things that I'd been reading for years from people that were doing everything from, you know, DIY photocopied bike zines to you know, academic scholarship where people had written about cycling or bike paths or car accidents and car culture. Um, and really just wanted to try to integrate that and do the best job I could of, um, you know, doing justice to the people had, who had been thinking about these issues for a long time before me. That's cool, man. And um, how did you come to write this book? I mean, have you, were you are you a part of were you a part of bike culture at the time? Are you part of bike culture now? I mean, do you identify with your bike in some way? Yeah, I mean, I definitely consider myself a, a cyclist for the rest of my life. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, this wasn't a project that came about as a result of me just, you know, sitting around and reading stuff about it. It yeah. came from me riding my bike first at college. And then when I moved to Pittsburgh for graduate school, um, it was cheap, it was convenient. And I realized very quickly, though, that there was this whole dynamic on the street that I had never given any thought to, which was people didn't want me there. Uh -huh. uh, and it was pretty obvious. And, you know, between the kind of responses you get from people and faces and people yelling things at you, um, it really started to make me think about all of these issues before I had either like a language to talk about them or an interest in even doing so. For me, it was more just like trying to figure out how I could assert myself on the street so that I was comfortable and didn't, you know, get in a wreck and hurt myself. Yeah. Uh, but really quickly, I put all these other issues into focus about how we get around and who's allowed to be in certain places and why that is. And in particular, just like the entire culture associated with automobiles and the way that cities are designed and how much space is afforded to them versus human beings. Yeah. Um, and at the time, like the other people who I knew were riding for the most part were punk rockers. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I played in the, I was in punk bands for almost 20 years. And when I first moved back here, you know, it was something that a handful of punks that I knew were into both because they were like BMX riders as a kid and also were bike messengers um, and so there was, you know, it just was like part of what some people were into and it yeah. kind of fit in with people's politics about, you know, kind of the idea of, of autonomy and, and sort of DIY culture extended to your transportation, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, it was partly that. And then also just my everyday experience on the street and thinking about these things. And then I had a really great class, um, with a professor named Kathy Blee hmm. in, uh, sociology and women's studies at Pitt. And it was, uh, it was dealt really explicitly with issues around like space and mm -hmm. in particular, you know, a lot of like Marxist geography kind of yeah. stuff, but, but not just that. Sure. Um, but between that and especially uh, work that I got turned on to from like the Situationist International and really thinking about the way that they were creatively, you know, critiquing and imagining and philosophizing about the city and yeah. about people's experience and how that fits into these larger, you know, cultural traits and, or more like, you know, cultural trends and ideas and, you know, so socioeconomic context and that sort of thing. And so it just be kind of came this mishmash of everything that was on my brain for a while, but I had, didn't really think about doing anything with it academically until, I don't know, maybe four years later. Yeah. And were you, were you in grad school in communications by the time that came to you as a kind of academic topic in that yeah, way? Yeah, the whole time I was. I mean, it initially started, I was going to do, a, I was going to do a PhD dissertation on culture jamming groups. Okay. And the, I, I sort of had this idea in my head to talk about like uh, sort of high concept technology stuff and, and, and more like lo-fi version. And so mm -hmm. I was really into some folks that had been involved with CMU and uh, the Critical Arts Ensemble or Critical Art Ensemble and some offshoots of different groups that were involved with that, as well as people that were doing, uh, you know, 
things like ad busters and yeah. And so I started thinking about critical mass and the bike ride that people would take, you know, the last Friday of every month, mm -hmm. we'll talk about the history of that a little bit. Um, and I was really thinking about that as like an interesting way to try to, you know, say something or intervene, or at least like have a, an active performative kind of critique of, of car culture itself. And, yeah. uh, and by doing it, you know, by getting on a bike and just like riding and having fun. Yeah. Um, and so that was the place where I started the project. And then I was like, huh, there really hasn't been nothing to my satisfaction, at least at the time that sort of gave yeah. this broader history that I was interested in. The only place that I really saw that was from folks who were critical mass participants <laughs> um, and a number of whom were, you know, really incredible writers and thinkers who used to do stuff with like process world zine back in the 80s and involved with lots of interesting kind of things. And so very interested in archiving, you know, their own city and its own uh, yeah, you know, its own anti-authoritarian kind of practices and subversive stuff. So I read some things about, you know, bike protest and I believe it was like the 1890s. And then I read some other things about, you know, lots of stuff about women and cycling. And then I ran across some stuff about the about this group of socialist cycling club called the Clarion Cycling Club in England. And, I, you know, I basically talked to my advisor. I'm like, I read about bikes. So, <laughs> yeah. So, is that How fine? would that fly in the communications? <laughs> I mean, my, it's jo was it well. Jonathan Stern is your advisor. Yeah. I mean, I he's mean, a very open minded guy. <laughs> so like for sure. And I yeah. mean, him and um, Carol Stabile is also somebody that played a really important role in, in my thinking and mentorship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Jonathan was the main person that I worked with in school. And all of his courses really, you know, were as much communication as they were history of philosophy of technology. Yeah. Um, and so the, yeah, the kind of approach that I took to thinking about that, it was very based around communication and cultural studies, but uh, it definitely was not the kind of, you know, object of study that most people do in my, in my field. Yeah. I mean, which, wasn't which there, make for, which didn't make for great job applications. <laughs> for the time around. Uh, what, wasn't there also, uh, you know, I, my first book was about automobiles. So wasn't there also, during the time you were in school, already a kind of a literature on transportation and communications, bringing those together. Yeah, that was there kind was, of a thing, right? There was there were some things. Um, it's weird because you know when you're working on a project and you're kind of diving into something where there is no clear, coherent, you know, singular archive or a particular field, and you're you know you're kind of compiling things, and especially when you're just as interested in trying to like pull as much from like DIY punk culture as academia. Yeah. Um, you know, you run across certain thing. Like I knew of Jeremy Packer's work. Yeah, for example, exactly. He went to school with uh, Jonathan Stern, yeah. my advisor. And so there were a few people in that respect where I got turned on to other people thinking about cars and automobility. And then as I got further into the project and, and even more so when I turned it into a book found, you know, this really great, body of work that you know, broadly is under the umbrella of the journal mobilities um, but people like john yuri and mimi scheller uh -huh. um and jeremy spinney wrote a lot about cycling and lots of people that are written about car culture and, and automobiles and came at it from some really interesting angles so it was definitely something where i was just trying to both you know situate myself and try to have something to say in addition yeah. you know and i, I love also it, man. thought it was really important for a book at least to pretty meticulously document all the stuff that I looked at because I wanted mm. to, I wanted to put it all in one place, both because I have a terrible memory and <laughs> to just like, you know, give credit where it was due. Yeah, man. Well, I think I love it. I love the story from like punk rock to uh, through all these academic literatures. It's a, it's a nice trajectory. So you, you start the book with a description of New York City's crackdown on critical mass, um, which is this long running bike gathering that also acts as a form of activism, as, as you said. So can you tell um, listeners a bit about critical mass in case they don't know about it and also say why you found this a good way to open up your book? Yeah, so critical mass started in uh, the early 90s and it was organized. Uh, initially, there was a thing called, I believe it was called the commute clot. And it was a group of people who were bike commuters that decided that they wanted to get together and take a collective ride home after works, so to speak, and kind of like take over the street a little bit and, you know, get an experience of what that was like rather than being 
you know, single individual people just like smushed along the side of the road, but just try to get a bunch of people together. Um, and then I'm forgetting the documentarian's name, but a uh, person made a, a documentary film about cycling and they spent a bunch of time in Amsterdam and China and a bunch of places with, at the time, you know, very active bike cultures. And they did a screening of that in San Francisco. And there's a, there's a scene in that film where all of these people, cyclists are congregating in, uh, in an intersection in China and waiting until there's just this, what they described in the film as this critical mass of cyclists that would become so big that then they just all went and hmm. took over the street and all the cars had to stop. Hmm. Um, and so they adopted that name and then it became this thing where it was the last Friday of every month. And the idea was basically that it could be anything that people wanted to do with it. Essentially it could be, yeah. It was it was a protest and a party or just a bike ride and it was kind of theorized and put into practice as this thing that anybody could you know articulate what that message was and, yeah you know they referred to it as like xerocracy of you know the the photocopier as people's instrument to describe why people were there and what they were doing um and so it became this if this really interesting phenomenon where it both drew attention to cycling and in some places it got very, very politicized uh, because of either the events being really big or in a lot of cases where they were small and so it was more marginalized and hmm. viewed more skeptically. Um, you know, sometimes you'd have some really aggressive cyclists on rides that would be kind of antagonistic to, to drivers, I think in part to, from, you know, people's everyday experience of being sort of pushed to the side of the road. Yeah. Not to make excuses, but you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was that sort of element. But for the most part, you know, you had all of these people coming together that were really interested in trying to do this thing. And it sort of goes in direct conflict with, you know, the norm of American streets, which is that cars rule and everybody else is just sort of uh, window dressing on the side. And yeah. so it was trying to flip that just for even a few minutes and even putting people in the position where they had to wait in their cars was really upsetting to lots of folks you know there'd be lots of columns written and articles and people speculating about this stuff and lots of complaints from drivers and things but um it had a really interesting impact on raising a huge amount of awareness around cycling and also for people that saw that as like a protest or a radical or something like that it helped to mainstream and legitimize uh cycling advocates and groups that had been around in places you know trying yeah. to do the the boring necessary work of, you know, going to town hall meetings and trying to get ordinances passed to get bike lanes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And when, when was the first time you participated in a critical mass? Do you remember? Maybe 2000, 2001. Where were you at? Pittsburgh. You were in Pittsburgh. So it, yeah. it, it was going on then. So like, Within a yeah, decade. I was, yeah, I think it was it was happening a little bit before that, too. Like, okay. they were pretty small rides. But um, yeah, I went on a few of them. I wasn't something that I was an active participant all the yeah. time in. I went on some rides there. Um, I think I went on one in Seattle. I went on a few in Chicago. Um, but it was something that I enjoyed doing. It's also at the time in, in Pittsburgh. I mean, just to give you an idea, like in the late 90s, like 1999, um, I would know who was at my university, like a big university, like based on the bike rack. Like I'd be like, oh, there's like, you know, weird yeah, yeah. professor guy. And there's my one friend that's a messenger. And yeah, yeah. Like that level of, you know, there's like a handful of like old environmental studies professors and a few <laughs> smattering old hippies and like yeah. know, Euro European expats. And then like weirdo punks and some college kids that just are broke. And that <laughs> That was like, that was a lot of the people that yeah. see biking regularly, you know, and it, it's something that I don't think it's because of critical mass that it got more popular. I think it's for a variety of different reasons, um, especially in the years since then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that was part of my interest in it. And, you know, it was a clear way that you could point to people actively trying to not just ride, but to think about what it meant to do that and to think about car culture and to talk to put it in a language and a framework that was meant for anybody to understand, you know, it wasn't yeah. meant to be something that was, you know, some preserved knowledge in the Academy or something yeah. like that. It was, you know, it was intended to be like, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're up to. And this is why cars are a problem that we don't tend to think about. Yeah. And so New York, like really cracked down on these things, right? 
Yeah. And there in particular, I mean, I, I started with the example in the book because it was, I mean, it was a huge ride, but it was also at a, a political event. It was at the, you know, uh, 2004 RNC uh, event, I believe it was. Yeah. And so, you know, you had this kind of convergence of things going on, but it also marked this period where, in hindsight, people found out that, you know, the FBI had been spying on critical mass organizers. I interviewed somebody who was uh, working at one of the organizations in um, the area, and they seemed very hesitant to talk to me first. And I was like, this is weird. And yeah. then I realized afterward that they were kind of sketchy, but, you know, who's this random guy from Pittsburgh asking me questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who wants to interview me and, like, has read and knows a lot about our... <laughs> political strategy kind of thing and i was like i was like it's cool but like i'm all right this dude's a spook um, and he was he was getting the, his group was getting spied on by yeah friends. right and so you know you have all of this this ridiculous interest in people that are trying to organize a bike ride or yeah if it was a protest or whatever it was for it was it was pretty wild and that's in addition to the fact that the, the police there i mean they're notoriously you know aggressive and heavy sure. with everybody but um, yeah, there were a lot of rides, but you can see videos online of just like punching people out off their bikes. Jesus. Um, and millions like, of know. dollars. I mean, you had this like oh, ridiculous, this yeah. economist had, uh, in the intro, you recount how this economist had done some like figures on it and it was like millions of dollars they were spending to try to, yeah. Yeah. To spy on people having a bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. And in a city, and in a city where. Out of all the places where it's not, you know, if it was like Houston or something where highways have been, I mean, that's changing too, but highways have been, you know, life there forever. And yeah. Where you also had a concentration of people that were, you know, right wing think tank funded would look at Houston and places like that as like the models for what we should have because they have like, you know, very minimal zoning restrictions. Right. It's car based. You know, you don't have like hippies like me trying to advocate for cycling and public transit and that sort of thing yeah um, but yeah it's uh you know I have people in portland that i spoke with like they had dealt with tons of hassle from the cops mm -hmm. um and also really ridiculous levels of infiltration and spying as if this was some you know secret network of, yeah i don't know what so um, i mean for you know, me like, yeah. oh go ahead no no it's fine yeah, you know, for me, what it what the what the critical mass example did is kind of like split open the issue, right? Because you have cops and the state power coming and cracking down on these bicycle activists, um, and you know, part of what it is is just reinforcing this system we have of of car culture, right? And in the intro, you you have, I mean, just these staggering statistics about like how the like what. 1% of Americans use bicycles as a form of transportation and half that use it to get to work and just how far away this is from the the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, you have, you even, it's not just like Dutch people, but you, you say like Canadians near the North Pole use bikes more often than Americans do, which... That's what I found at the time. That <laughs> yeah. was actually like, I'm glad you pointed that out because that was one of the things I was like, come on. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it makes sense if you're trying to think about a way to individually just be able to, like, get around in a particular place. If you can make that work yeah. with your setup, you know, it's a lot more convenient than having to, you know, it's a lot easier to fix and, and not a, a lot less things to worry about than a car in the middle of winter. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's the exact opposite of, of what you think. And I don't know if those stats have changed much at sure, all. I would sure. highly doubt it. Though. Yeah. Um, we're still talking about like a just a infinitesimally small amount of people in comparison to the full population. Yeah. At the same time though, things have, I think gotten radically different in some cities since I wrote the book uh, or the, since the book came out like 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, Cause I'd been working on research for that for many years before that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's, there's a lot of cities where the entire infrastructure has changed. People's attitudes about it have shifted there's been entire cycles of cycling go going from everything to fringe to like hipster to backlash against the hipsterness yeah. of it from other cyclists to then shift into something else. You know, there's been yeah. like waves of responses and reactions. And I think that the combination of different things that have happened in some aspects of pop culture, as well as the internet, and the way that people had started to use 
you know, own their own websites and things that they could create and stuff that they could publish in, you know, the early like 2010s and that period onward where you started to see a circulation of ideas and perspectives about cycling that would have been really difficult to find before, especially if your only outlet for that was something like, you know, bicycling, bicycling magazine or something that was historically more fitness oriented. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, what I want, what I eventually want to talk to you about is like how you understand the, the construction of our car dominated culture and what you call the automobile industrial complex. But I thought as like a way to kind of get into that, you talk about the trope um, that Am Americans have a love affair with the automobile and how that kind of covers over things. So what do you what do you think that love affair with the automobile kind of trope um, kind of hides from us or? I mean, I think that with anything like that, there is part of it that's true. Right. Sure. I mean, there's aspects about driving a car that are super fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least for me, my experience of it, it can be really fun just as much as it can be, you know, absolutely devastating to your body, your memories, your experiences of trauma, people that a lot of people have known that have died or been maimed and injured, injured, yeah. um, maimed in accidents. I mean, yeah. And so having the ability to think about all that stuff and to take that seriously constantly gets marginalized by this idea that does it. I think a lot of rhetorical work of pretending that somehow Americans all love cars. We've always loved cars. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we always will love cars. Yeah. And you know, and there are tons of things you can point to in pop culture to prove that. And so there's the reality of it, which is based on people's experiences and these you know, repository of, of images and representations that we have over the decades. But there's also the way that that stuff gets gets mobilized and, and sort of like put into practice and mm -hmm. as a as a kind of default set of assumptions where people don't have to then ask any follow up questions. It's just like, oh, Americans love cars. It's yeah. Like, what if they don't? You know, and even if they do, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, yeah. And not an and I think that it's really important to emphasize, so I should at the beginning of our conversation, that, you know, when my critiques of, of automobility have always been structural, right? This mm. isn't about either for me or I think people who are responsible bike advocates, not that I'm like, you know, the exemplar or something, but yeah. it was always important to me of what I learned from the people who had been doing that work for a while and were good at it and were smart in their thinking and were sympathetic and caring and understanding people empathetic that you know this isn't about trying to get individual people to make individual de decisions about their transportation that's great too yeah, yeah but it's more thinking about these larger factors that make cycling almost impossible for most people mm -hmm. and those are not about whether somebody wakes up and they're like should i drive or should i bike to work you know? <laughs> yeah like especially we love we doing that with everything in our culture though right it's like turning it 100%. into that kind of shit you yeah. know and, as, you know, you you said that you went to school in Pittsburgh yeah. and I mean, you know what the geography is like here. It's not something that is easy to contend with unless you if you're riding a bike in Pittsburgh, especially around the period where I started. But even just now, yeah, you know, you have to be in pretty decent shape. You have to be physically able bodied. You have to be able to essentially be brave, you know, yeah, you have, have courage about it. And that's not something that people should have to have. If yeah, 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 yeah. Store, you know, um, it's fine if you're like, you know, 22 punk anarchist, like, you know, I was at the time and being like, yeah, fuck yeah. This. like I, I can ride my bike, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I belong here. Um, and I was cognizant of that at the time. And but part of it, I also kind of like took took some pride in. Yeah. But I also recognize that for most people, that was not a that was not a matter of even having a decision It'd be like, yeah, man, I just I can't do that. You know, right. I can't make it up the hills or like where I work now, you know, to get over there. It's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a colleague who rides. He lives a little closer than I do. But it's you know, it's not easy. at the, the yeah. last stretch too, and nobody rides bikes around there. So it's like, yeah no one has the experience. You know, people get really nervous. They don't know what to do with their cars and stuff. Yeah. So. I do think it's I just wanted to mention that stuff because I think it's very easy and it's often, unfortunately, the easy tactic of saying like, well, lots of people can't ride bikes. It's like, yes, I know. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the point is that there should be other options available. And it's more about thinking about an entire way that we could reapproach 
how we do transportation, how yeah. we think about cities than it is about just getting people on bikes. Because I think public transit plays a way more important role in especially any future our ideas about mobility. Um, totally. But I think that the two are go hand in hand. Yeah, know? yeah. And like, you know, good bikes have, or good buses have bike racks and there's they can connect to each other too. For sure. Um, so, I mean, like sketch, sketch that out. I mean, so, you know, some, some listeners probably will not have thought about this kind of going from the 1890s and like when bicycles yep. kind of were the thing to like the critical mass moment in the nineties or something like that, where like bicyclists just riding together cause fury and like how that change happened. So, I mean, like, you know, just at a high level, can you sketch out that history a bit? Like how you think what you call the audio automobile industrial complex kind of came to be? Sure. I think that a lot of what, when, when I was first thinking about these issues and what we talked about so far, so much of the people I was interested in were are thinking about bikes as an alternative, as a solution to this problem of car culture. And when I started thinking about it a little bit more in a little bit more of a complicated sense, what struck me was that the the thread that kind of tied these things together about transportation was this idea of automobility that's bigger than just driving a car, but the idea of like self propulsion and autonomy through your own mobility. And that's something that that really came to people from the bicycle in the 1890s. Um, and because it was the first time that, you know, women had the ability to ride transportation of their own accord where they didn't have a chaperone. Mm -hmm. um, there's been tons of great stuff written, written about that um, as well. I mean, still dealing with like the incredibly awful social norms where, you know, it's not like you could be black and ride a bike in the, the 1890s and yeah. not, not deal with <laughs> everything you had to deal with when you were black in the 1890s yeah um, or just most periods of time in the US totally um, but that whole era really gave people an experience of like independence and riding and having the ability to like you know go see the woods or go here and there and go out for fun and join these clubs or in the case of yeah, yeah, yeah. with women you know to dress differently and to have this thing that sort of served as both like a vehicle and a metaphor for your experience. And so all of that is also comes along with people wanting to create infrastructure that we need roads to ride these bikes on. Yeah. Um, the first rest stops were created by cyclists. Um, and so you have this whole kind of culture of transportation, at least from my perspective, from what I looked at, that all sort of points to a place where cars almost come as this logical conclusion of the kinds of ideas that are embedded in what the bicycle means it's mm -hmm. the car is just like the faster version yeah it's fun you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in that sense but there wasn't there was nothing to sort of compare cycling to and by way of other motorized transportation just would have been horses right yeah and there's lots of interesting stuff about about that as well but you know it's a it's both like a really liberatory thing at the end of you know the turn of the century Part of it was also this, you know, what it refers to as the bicycle craze. So it was a yeah. trend. It was popular. Um, but then, you know, you get into the 1920s up in that period. That's when, you know, Ford is making cars. And at the end of that decade is really when a lot more people have access to them than did before. Um, in that gap period, I didn't find that, you know, there was a huge amount of, of interest, though, in adults riding bicycles other mm. than just like basic functionality. It wasn't people did, but it yeah. wasn't something that I found lots of literature about or people talking about, you know, this this I don't know, halcyon time of, uh, you know, cycling somehow from like, you know, the, the zeros to the, the, the roaring 20s or something. Yeah. Um, but I think it's one of those things that for people who lived in rural areas, they use, everybody sort of relied on, on horses, both mm -hmm. in cities and in rural areas and then carriages and, and horse pulled omnibuses. And, and it was just kind of this metamorphosis of mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, wagons and riding on stuff, uh, whether you were propelling them with an animal or mm -hmm. riding in them, that just became the kind of model for things. And really like once cars become a little bit more popular, and that's when you have a number of things happen. I mean, there's a great book from uh, author, his last name's Norton. I'm forgetting. Peter Norton. Right yeah, Peter Fighting Norton. Traffic. Fantastic book. book. Yeah. And I had read the, a piece from that book that was published before, uh, I think it was in Technology and Culture as an article 
um, that talked about the way that jaywalking became a thing yeah. that was essentially invented. You know, it becomes a way for, uh, you know, the people who work on behalf of the automobile industry, the AAA um, car sellers, other people who have an interest in, you know, having cars become more of a thing in cities. I mean, cities were dense and clogged. Yeah. There's, there's horses, there's walkers, there's tracks in the street for trolleys, there's glass everywhere. This is pre- Have you ever seen that 1909 uh, San Francisco streetcar video? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll link to it in yeah. the in the show notes. But I mean, yeah, it's a wonderful illustration of what you're talking about. This very sure. dense multimodal thing going on. And then you, ha- I mean, you do have this very like concerted effort. And I think it's what he documents really well yeah. of not just, not just perpetuating a certain idea about the street, but also an entire discourse that then becomes law, right. Yeah. Of defining the act of just being on the street as you're, you know, you're doing something wrong. It's like the act of standing becomes loitering. You yeah. know, later, um, but the, uh, you know, you're or hanging out or whatever, but right. as far as being in the street, you know, jaywalking and the implications of it being, you know, you were like, you know, like an ignorant hick or something with your yeah. up in the clouds. Jay means um, hick basically. Is yeah. Hey, yeah. seed. Uh, yeah. Hick. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean that you see with that whole period, people are buying cars. You have these shifting ideas that are starting to give them priority through laws as well as cultural norms that are developing some of them are developing in response to things like laws yeah um and so you have this kind of convergence of stuff going on that had been happening for a while some of it started by cyclists themselves some that were just a result of different modes of transportation different way of using the streets um and you know up and then you also have these grand visions of automobility from like Norman Bel Geddes in the 36 World's Fair with the Futurama exhibit. We'll link to that too. That's a yeah, beautiful just, video you know, too. It's, an, it's this amazing yeah. thing. It's, but it's also, it's both amazing. It's, it's awesome in every sense of the word, as well as just being like terrifying and, you know, and awful, like this dystopian, you know, massive skyscrapers and huge fast roads. And you can see the appeal of like how modern and cool that would be, but it's also just like, you want to live that way? <laughs> um, especially if you know you were anybody who lived in a city at that time, right? Yeah, people hanging out everywhere, and like that's where people hung out. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Just, people don't have air conditioning, especially when it's warm. Like everybody's just out in the streets. You mm-hmm. know? And, like that's mm-hmm. where life, city life, is. Yeah. Um. So I mean, you know, you have these grand visions of things like that, but then you also have these shifts that start to take place in like, you know, federal spending priorities, the creation yeah. of the Highway Act the highway and defense act also those two very yeah. tied together and suburbanization um, do you see that as part of the story for sure yeah for sure and and a lot i think it's a real easy thing for people to say you know cars created the suburbs and they sort of leave it at that yeah um but that's not the case i mean cars undoubtedly contributed to it like there's no way you could have yeah what we know as the suburbs especially like levittown and some of the first ones without cars but totally you know s- suburbs originally started as extension they were neighborhoods as extension lines on the end of, of train routes. Right. Of, Streetcar you know, suburbs. Like, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And so if you want to blame anybody, you know, you can blame, you can blame real estate. Uh, yeah. Involved in buying and selling of land and, and developers and things. But totally. I mean, yeah, that's how I always use like cars created the suburbs as like the, a, an example of like terrible technological determinism. For sure. Cause the story you just laid out, it's a construction involving all these interests and, powerful, you know, moneyed interests coming together to do something and, you know, to do something that there's like demand for, in, at least on some level, right? Like yeah. people do want these things. Yeah. So, and, you know, yeah. it's it's the real material embodiment of this much longer standing narrative of, you know, American, you know, go get them attitude. Yeah. You know, work, work, your, work yourself up the American, you know, it'd be so much so that it concurrently and later becomes the symbol of, you know, the American dream, right? The, yeah. the house of the picket fence. Like you don't have that in the city. Right. right? That, that, that's a suburban construction. And, you know, so there are things about that that were very desirable to people, folks coming back from war. Yeah. Um, black folks that lived in cities that wanted to live in, in nicer conditions and, of course, couldn't because of redlining. Yeah. Um, but there are all these interests that make suburbs desirable. Right. But yeah, the reality is that, yeah, once people get used to any aspect of life of having those be, I don't know, just there like a material reality, like yeah. cars are a necessity. 
Right. You know? And so you get this kind of reinforcing thing that really starts to happen in a very massive way through, you know, really just solidifies the way that things look now in the yeah. 1950s, you know? Do you um, think, think there's the only break with that is like, it's not even a break, but it's just like moments of rupture of yeah. know, 1973 oil crisis. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. yeah. Good point. Lots of people got really into bicycling then that lived in cities. It was referred to as like, you know, the, another bike boom. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's things here and there and there's always been an interest in people, you know, using psych- bicycles for utilitarian purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there just weren't many places where you could do that, even in cities. It was like you either chose to ride on the street or you could ride on the sidewalk, maybe. Yeah. But, you know, it was that's aside from all the cultural stuff about bikes becoming these things that were just viewed as like only for kids yeah i want to get to that but there's one thing i want before that's it's funny man i was going to talk to you about exactly like how they're seen as toys but let's push that for a second sure. um the you know going back to the love affair idea i was thinking about like i don't know about love affair i mean i definitely know people who love their cars and all that crap but i it, it led me to think about like the power of habit not love yeah you know um, and I'm I'm tr- I'm gonna tr- try to do a video soon about like habit, technology use, and climate change and these issues because I think it's really important. Yeah. But like, I mean, I mean, did you see the news uh, like this summer about people reacting to gas prices? <laughs> yeah. And then like our president, who's like supposedly like people the right would like to cast as like a lib environmentalist or something like that was like bending over backwards to get gas prices down. He was like having a yeah. panic attack because his numbers were tanking and all this shit. Yep. And I was like, dude, the power of habit in our current system, you know, like the people who are com- I'm like, I worry about like the 40% of Americans that can't make ends meet. We yeah. can show, I worry about those folks in any kind of inflation, you know? Um, but the people who I heard bitching about gas prices were not those people. Oh, of course. You know, yeah, and the, yeah. and a lot of people, the, them probably... They're always, they're always the people that have absolutely no skin in the game of having any of their rights or privileges even yeah. remotely, you know, in no possible way do they have to deal with giving over of anything of their own experiences doing fucking anything. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 always, it's always this constructed, manufactured idea. Excuse my language. No, um, dude, you go know, for it's, it. Always, it's always this manufactured crisis yeah. every day. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. Carlson does, Ben Shapiro, all those people. I mean, it's just this constant yeah. hammering home to the point where people start to actually believe like, oh, yeah, it is like a serious thing that these people want to, you know, exist and use it yeah. in a public place or whatever. You that's know, a good we're, point. We're, that's a good you know, point. So yeah. It's just without that people, yeah, the people who are complaining the hardest and, you know, there's a very real thing at the base of that, which is like, if you're paying, already paying a lot for gas, you yeah, know, that's a struggle. But yeah, the man. problem is, I think you're pointing to is the fact that there's no political space to actually talk about real substantive alternatives. Exactly. And it always gets deferred to like, if there even is a hint that, yeah, we'll, we'll think about that at some point down the road, which most of the time we don't even get that. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't happen. You know, yeah. anybody who's tried to broach transportation as a serious issue in American politics, especially any criticism of cars, gets destroyed. Yeah. You know, like, you can, Peter like Judge was one of the few people I've even heard, and I'm not a yeah. big fan of his, but yeah, yeah. He was, you know, he was actually like as working on transportation issues and talking about that. And there were some people here and there, but yeah. nothing that's trying to actually think about. Some of the stuff that, especially in the conclusion of my book, that I started thinking about at the end of this project, which was like, with all these complaints and just this whole network of, uh, you know, think tank funded people that write thousands of columns collectively and about some aspect of car culture. And it's always like yeah. that it's great, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but because of that, you know, you they're not dealing with even the practicality of like, you look at the most baseline projections about population increase by about halfway through this century mm-hmm. and what that's going to do for people's experience of traffic. Yeah. Like people aren't going to be able to go places the way that they used to, you know, like mm-hmm. people's worst experiences of traffic in a lot of places are going to be like everyday kinds of occurrences. Interesting. If you're looking at population increases that, you know, 
10 years ago, 12 years ago when I published or 12 years ago when I published the book that, you know, I was reading, which was like yeah. in a lot of places was that the urban populations were going to double by 2050. Um, yeah. So even with, even if you cling to this dream of that we're always going to have cars and they're great and there's nothing wrong with them. And anybody who talks about it is a wing nut. Yeah. Like, there's going to come a point where they're not going to work as designed. Right. And yeah. they already, they already don't. And that's part of the problem is that all of this conversation, all of the political debates, all of the discourse, except for a very small amount of it actually deals with the, the bigger issue aside from climate change, which is astronomical. Yeah. Yeah. Just that these things kill tons and tons of people. Oh, I'm with you. Know? you. I mean, this and is the thing, right? It's, it's still like 35,000 or 40,000 a year. For years, it yeah. was like 40, 42,000. It did yeah. for a while. I think it's back up. Oh, it's, it's, it's way back up since COVID. We don't really yeah. know what's going on, but it's way back up. Yeah. In the seventies, it was around 50,000 a year. And this is in addition to roughly 2 million accidents a year. Uh, you know, and the, the ability to just like not address that in any serious kind of way is, I mean, it's profoundly disrespectful to people that are killed, first of all. But it's also, the, yeah. you know, I, I lived through, I got politicized from living through a period where, you know, there was a, the U.S. went to multiple wars on the basis of 9-11. And, you know, yeah. as I was saying with some of my students recently, like you can't compare just in like body count the gravity of something like that event of course right? yeah but at the end of the day if you're talking about something horrific happening and people dying from it you're talking about the amount of people that basically die every month from cars yeah right? and that is all the time and then worldwide it's the number one killer of you know people under 30 i believe yeah number one and so it's like the ability to culturally to normalize that, to bury that, to basically make it completely, just render it totally invisible um, is extraordinarily powerful. And I think that, you know, that's what people are up against when they're trying to advocate anything about transportation. It's not just the vehicle itself yeah. or people's everyday experiences. That's hard enough. It's also that you're, you're talking about something that is so kind of deeply rooted yeah. that you can't even discuss tens of thousands of people every year that die. It's weird, right? Conversation. It's funny too. I think, um, I think how did automobile deaths become normalized is the question I've been asked most often by journalists. Cause I think what when you, you even start, know. I mean, what, what, well, I don't, it's a, it's a debate within the history. You know, I mean, I yeah. don't think we really understand. It's fucking weird. I mean, yeah, totally. it, um, I don't think there really is a best treatment of it. I mean, I've heard people working on it. They're trying to work on it right now. Um, in fact, there's a project at the university of Maryland on the, on the question to some degree, but it's just like, but it's like, if you think about it for half a fucking second, it's like 40,000 people are dying a year from this technology and but we're not talking about that routinely you know it's somehow like that can't come up in conversation i mean, I mean is, I, I, as far as thinking about for me at least the 50s being a period where all of this stuff gels i mean yeah this is the also the this is the cold war era right this is yeah mccarthyism this is like our culture is very good at producing like pretty radically dystopian and 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 fundamentally just like psychopathic kinds of ideas that they're just like totally normal at the time yeah right? like, that's maybe true, we man. use nukes yeah, yeah, you know yeah. i mean like <laughs> the more I, you know, more i learn about that period you know from listening yeah. to like, the blowback podcast of like the you know the cuban revolution and and just again realizing like, how close the yeah, us yeah. was to to starting a nuclear war and it's like it's maybe it's not surprising in the wake of yeah. that, that, you know, people getting into car wrecks and hurting themselves isn't the biggest deal in the world. You know, yeah. it's like in comparison to the recent memory of World War Two of, you know, the dropping nuclear weapons on another country on civilian populations. Like, I, I don't think how... everybody thinks about that stuff all the yeah. time, of course. But as far as just like the normalization of what people are willing to tolerate without feeling like morally outraged or you know, wanting to dissent or disagree from that in some way, or even having it on their radar. Yeah. Um, I think there's something to be said for that. Yeah. 
And I, I also wonder, it's just like we were talking about habit earlier. It's just like we're all so yeah. many of our lives are so bought into the system. We just don't want to fucking hear about it. You yeah. Know? And it's like, I mean, there's also a lot of problems that people haven't found good solutions for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or if they have, they've been really relegated to the sidelines and they they both seem weird to a lot of people. And yeah. even for someone like me that's into cycling, I know that they have some work to do. So, for example, like I started really thinking and trying to do as much research, research as I could on people who were doing any kind of enclosed design of pedal powered machines. Yeah. Right? All of them look ridiculous. And uh-huh. I don't, you know, uh-huh. res- respectfully to the people who make them. And I don't mean ob- objectively ridiculous. I mean, like, in comparison to what people think of as, like, this is how I'm going to get around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, even if that's a functional thing, like, that's a weird transition for a lot of people to get used to. You yeah. Know? But at the same time, those are the kinds of things that would make it so that you don't have to be, like, you know, a fit person or you have to be, like, tolerant of yeah, yeah, yeah. horrible point. weather to that's be on a interesting. bike. Or you can yeah. be a passenger and, like, something aside from just a sort of, you know, pedicab or rickshaw kind of d- device. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that there's a lot of possibilities with stuff like that that could change people's habits in ways that would if, – if they were easier and they didn't feel – ridiculous or strange or abnormal to people and i still think that any break with habit involves acknowledging how difficult that is in a lot of different registers but i think that there's room for to do some things and i think that that's not just an infrastructural issue which is like the most important thing in my opinion Um, but i think that it's also something that if people could put some energy and effort into mm. thinking about some possibilities for that, because then it isn't just like, do you individually have to get on a bike? It's like, oh, I could ride in this thing. Yeah. Or I could sit upright or, you know, yeah. recumbent bikes are the closest example you have of, of things where people sometimes shift into using those. Those sit like a foot off the ground. Yeah. You know, I've been terrified the only, two, the only time I took one of those on on a street with automobile traffic. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Just got to have a the infrastructural thing really is important. It's everything. You know, yeah, and yeah. so it's like yeah. I'm with you, Rob. Yeah. Habit, but I mean habit is a really powerful thing, you know. And I think that the bigger <sighs> thing about habit is is what we is the kinds of habits that we don't choose, you know. It's like having yes. to pay for gas, having to pay for insurance, car payments, and then you know, you have to work a job to get car payments and you have to have a car to get to work <laughs> yeah yeah and then places. we get sick sitting at our desks you know <laughs> like yeah we can just keep around. going all day long you know and talk yeah, about. yeah and i think there's you know there are <laughs> when you talk about like all different kinds of, of practices and uses of technologies and ways that we use our bodies and ways that we think about the spaces and places that we inhabit there are all of these different points of intersection that you can look to and be like well what about this and what about this and what about this and you know, it can some that can sometimes be overwhelming and distracting because it seems like too much. You know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's just capitalism or it's just the way we relate to technology is that transcends capitalism. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or it's or it's trans only transportation or no, it's this, you know, and I think all of those questions and critiques and ideas are really important. And but uh-huh. I also think that recognizing that there's a big gap between the way a lot of people pose questions about these issues and the kind of work that people do on a practical basis to put this stuff, you know, into play yes. in the public sphere versus also people's just everyday experience of trying to get around. Yeah, you man, know? I'm with you. I mean, that's part of what the video I want to do on climate change is about. It's like, I mean, it go. it's kind of a multi-step process, but where it, where it kind of ends up is just like the role of the power of habit in keeping us locked into our current system. Yeah. And, you know, then I talk about the Biden gas price thing and it's like, it's really clear that you can't change this thing because climate policy was gonna, is going to do a lot more than change our gas prices, you know, yeah. if we do it right. Um, it's really clear you can only walk against that or across that chasm if you find a way to actually do it that brings people in. Yeah. You know, if, if, if they feel like you're attacking them and being an asshole or whatever, looking down on them, it's never going to fly. Because this is like a, it's going to take like 20 or 30 years to make the kind of transition that we have to. We're just swinging around and every... Both sides have different ideas about this stuff. It's never going to work, you know? Yeah, especially when you look at some of, you know, the structural factors like 
our electrical grid and yep. bridges and stuff like that. I mean, those are all things that should have been radically more funded than they were a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that those rule out the possibilities for doing all kinds of things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can't just like, you know, safely cross a river yeah. or a stretch of land. Like, you know, there was a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh not long ago. Thankfully, yeah. no one, you know, nobody got hurt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I do think that the issue is, I'm of two minds about people uh, getting upset with the way that advocates talk about things. Yeah, on the yeah. One oh, hand, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think on the one hand, it is really important. And I think some people really need to think much harder about how what they say can be interpreted as, as looking down on people and, and, yeah. and making fun of them or thinking you're better than them. We also happen to live at a moment right now where that is the dominant MO of, you know, conservative right wing kind of thinking that is really widespread, which is that everything anybody does is a threat to you. Yeah. Right? yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. And it's oh, yeah. You're dude. stupid. You know, so if all oh, you yeah, feel like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. we shouldn't, you know, <laughs> shit on the environment. They're like, you better than me. You know, you think you're better. Yeah, than yeah, me? yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. like, I drive a truck. You're like, no, dude, it's not what it's about. You know, <laughs> yeah. this is. Yeah. And so I think that there's that's something that but regardless, people have to think strategically and carefully about that. Yeah. At the same time, I also think that people need to be, I mean, if we're just talking about climate change and not cycling, I think people need to be far more aggressive and militant in the way that they're approaching those kinds of issues. Because these, yeah. are, these aren't things that are like, you know, <laughs> these aren't small stakes, right? No, I mean, no, no. I, you know, I hear so you, So I man. think that, yeah. Um, but you aren't going to be able to make any headroom if you're trying to like go to war with people as opposed to really focusing on institutions and structural kinds of yeah. forces and you know i mean that both in the, like the socioeconomic you know marxian sense yeah. as well as structurally like as in our infrastructure you know yeah. the actual built environment we have it um you uh so one of the thing one of the thing parts of your book i really liked is your history of what you call um like bicycle counterculture and like going back to the 60s and 70s and the kind of yeah, how activists were formed around bicycles sometimes. So I, it just felt really fresh. I had no, I had no knowledge of this pre-critical mass stuff, you know? Thanks, and so, I appreciate it. What's that? I said, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, of course, man. So, I mean, can how did you find those stories? And, um, and also, um, you know, if you were going to tell a friend, for instance, about a couple of things you found from that period that you think is cool, yeah, just lay it on us. First and foremost, I would give credit to a piece I read from Paul Rosen. Okay. That was actually uh, about like he used the, I think the phrase like the counterculture of bicycling, I think was like his, mm -hmm. his phrase. Um, but he was interested from this kind of socio-technical analysis end of things like this kind of cohort of, you know, environmentalist mm -hmm. DIYers uh, from the 70s in particular. But, uh, you know, the, a lot of ethics and ideas and practices from the 60s that fed into that and, and paved the way for it. Um, he was the one he was one of the people that I read in that regard. And then all the other stuff was just kind of the extensions of those things that I saw from reading a lot and having a lot of conversations with bike messengers of the cool. 1980s, where like those become really important subcultures for people in a lot of different cities that make cycling. That's something that's like practical and, and cool. You know yeah. I mean? It's like, I'm sure there's loads of people that don't think that's cool, but I mean, yeah, yeah. people like me, it was like, <laughs> that's fucking cool, man. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. People just flying around on, you know, single speed bikes and like whipping through traffic. Like it's nothing, you know, yeah. it's like a, it's a wild thing. I think for people to, to, to see probably very frustrating to, to drivers and like, you know, New York city in the eighties or whatever, but yeah. Um, you know, you get these, pockets of places where people kind of form their own subcultures mm -hmm. around cycling that means different kinds of things you know yeah. and like there are these important threads i think that connect them sometimes through particular people and institutions like bike shops mm -hmm. you know like in new york you've had like bicycle habitat has been there forever um i'm forgetting some people's names right now which i feel terrible about but you know there's like a lot of people involved in early advocacy like making bike advocacy a thing in the early uh -huh. 70s in certain cities in philly in new york in san francisco a handful of other places where you know those folks stuck around and continued to do work around environmentalism or around um nuclear energy for example with charles Komanoff in new york and like yeah. there's these clear threads of people's interest that extend 
into environmentalism, into critiques of technology that are about, you know, technocracy or mm -hmm. whatever kind of framework you want to think about it from. But for me, it was the people that gave a voice both like explicitly to some people who cited them and a nice framework where people like E.F. Schumacher and Yvonne Illich, yeah. um, Louis Mumford, um, you know, but then lots of other people who were just they were into these writing. folks. They were For reading sure. Mumford and, and stuff, yeah. Absolutely. And nice. and and reading you know, they're reading people like Mumford and Jane Jacobs and people mm -hmm. that were having conversations in the public sphere as like the antithesis of people like Robert Moses and the idea of, you know, designing cities. I mean, he I think he once described it as, you know, designing with a meat cleaver, something yeah, like that. Cleaver, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um it's just, you know, horrific, inhumane kinds of ideas about what you do and just displacing thousands of people you know yeah um so you know i think you get these threads of these different kind of larger countercultural attitudes that extend from the 60s and 70s that are sometimes very informed by you know the anti-nuclear war anti-war in general with vietnam rethinking about technology mm -hmm. um, people you know like the the entire movement of uh, the whole earth catalog and like, uh, yeah, yeah. All that sort of stuff is feeding into a lot of people's consciousness very explicitly. And it's just kind of like in the air for anybody who's involved in anything that's remotely like countercultural. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think that I think counter is counterculture more about like the ethics and ideas and practices and subcultures more about like the way that some of those ideas and practices get, codified into like specific communities so okay kind of have that's their own, neat. i like that distinction yeah yeah kind of have their own like niche stuff yeah on, like it know? could just be fashion or sound or something but there's it no it can be and yeah. then like but in some cases you do have these you know like punk subcultures uh, in a lot of cases are like part of a, a bigger counterculture you know? yeah yeah um, and there's venn diagrams it, we could draw and think about different <laughs> yeah, movements right absolutely absolutely <laughs> punks not punks right? yeah um <laughs> stuff like that but yeah you have not to like, you know, glamorize punks, it's just my, <laughs> no. my own, my own experience. There's tons of problems. Yeah. Punk's, punk's not dead, well. bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I think you have this interesting ensemble of people doing different things around cycling and with pedal power and, uh -huh. you know, giving voice to different ideas that, and that extend. And then are they really with these subcultures that I think develop in the eighties and nineties around cycling, a lot of this stuff starts to smoosh together and merge Yeah, exactly. Um, around the time that I'm riding bikes for the first time. Oh, that's um, interesting. And it's partly because I'm noticing it for the first time, but yeah. it's also because, I mean, I really tried to read and everything I could get a hold of at the time. And uh, the, especially the interviews that I did, I did a lot of interviews with people over the years and, people spoke really clearly to that, you know, yeah. to, to the point where it was pretty, you know, it was like kind of understood if you were talking to somebody that like, you know, you get it. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, of, yeah. You know, like you understand, you know, the, the, the casual things that people would make reference to. I mean, you know what I mean? Like when I was involved with the whatever anti-war thing, or, yeah, 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 yeah. we were, <laughs> we were involved in this, you know, anti-highway protests and, you know, That's matter so of cool, fact man. sort of things that you realize these different kind of converging interests um, as well as like these other threads of really cool stuff that like, wasn't my scene is huge, yeah. here, but like mountain biking, for example, you know, yep, yep, um, yep, yep. and talking yep. to folks that were involved in, you know, early mountain biking. And that was very much this rejection of mainstream cycling technology and culture. And, you know, it was just like people getting together and flying down hills with yeah, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Parts that they pull <laughs> yeah. out and be like, okay, how did this thing get destroyed? Like, right, right. Can, how can we do that this? better? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I think you get like these really kind of cool tinkering communities and people doing different things with their own, you know, DIY, both as like a political cultural strategy, but also as like a very technological thing. You yeah. Know, make your own stuff fix your own things, make your own parts, maybe start your own business if it doesn't exist, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, one, I love the way you draw on all these different kinds of knowledges, by the way. I think it's really cool the way you draw on everything from interview type situations to just being a part of these communities to doing all this media stuff. And um, Thank you. I want to turn to the media stuff for a second. So I shared your book with my uh, friend, historian Eric Hounchel, who's a bike nut. He lives in Switzerland um and he just had a, a baby his he and his wife just had a baby and he just bought like a really nice uh 
a thing Congrats for behind his <laughs> uh, nice thing behind, uh, you know, get around. And, um, he, you know, he, he hangs out at bike shops in, in Switzerland. It sounds really ideal, man. He's, he sounds happy and like it's a wonderful life. But I sent him your, your book and, um, he, you know, he's, he was saying like, you know, some people might like look at the media representations chapter and say like, oh, that's kind of a silly thing to focus on in this overall story. And he's like, no, but that's like seriously important when it comes to this stuff. And one of the things he was saying is that like how often, um, you know, bikes are basically represented as toys in our culture, you know? Absolutely. And, and so what are, you know, what are some of the ways that you think media representations are kind of like affect our conversations around cycling and cars in unhelpful ways? I mean, generally, people don't have representations of things that relate to what they do, how they live, who they are. They, they sort of don't exist, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, or at least there's this massive disconnect between what people do or what they imagine is possible. Um, and it's not to look at media as something absolutely deterministic kind of way but I, I think you you don't have to be a you know, you know simplistic cause and effect kind of uh, yep exactly to suggest that you patterns of representation especially years decades in yep. news in films in tv and everywhere if you see the same sort of things over and over and over i mean those become your entire basis of what you think of as normal right yeah I even That's since I wrote good. the book, like so when I wrote the when I wrote the book, there were two things that I was interested in. Some and some of these, I had been kicking around some things, and then also read some really good articles here and there where they talked about a certain film, and I was like, oh my god, yes! And so again, tried to like combine things. But from my perspective, all of the films that existed in the sort of pantheon of you know American mainstream kind of film, there was like almost nothing that showed bicycling as an everyday activity that people did for transportation anywhere yeah that's right? true you'd, maybe you'd see some images and it's et films. dude <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the, the chase scene in et uh what's the actual name of the movie um with the cutters oh you know, man the cyclists with the the working class kids in in, in Bloomington, indiana yeah shit i can't i can't believe i can't remember the i name know of the worst, i'm the worst oh cyclist my god ever. jesus <laughs> Uh, but you know, you, yeah, there was you, BMX yeah. movies and there was all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, the, BM, the the BMX bike from uh, the, uh, from Rad is in the Bicycle Museum in in Pittsburgh. Oh, Has this awesome. Pee Wee's bike, but like Pee Wee Hermie, you yeah. Know, you look at who rides Pee-wee. bikes; they're freaks, right? They're, yeah. they're like mainstream Hollywood standards, like hetero, you know, macho car culture yeah. Hollywood standards. Yeah, People yeah, yeah. Who ride bikes are are <laughs> they, you're like forty year old virgins, thirty year old paper boys. Yeah, you know they're people who's again like you know their sexuality is maybe ambiguous or something. <laughs> yeah, which totally course, true, again, right? In yeah. the realm of of film, is presented as being like odd, as weird, as queer. Yeah, in in not the you know post appropriated way that people you know think of queer, but like yeah, in the bad sense, in the yeah. pejorative sense. Um, and even since the book came out, I mean, you're going to find a lot more examples just because there's far more media outlets now, Yeah, um, kind of, especially just with television shows. And I do think you could look at, I'd be interested in reading somebody's like wider study of like the last 10 years of, of media representations of what those look like. Yeah. But I mean, those do impact people, man. They really yeah, yeah, shape yeah. what you think about stuff. And if you think that cycling is just some weird thing, that those that fits into people's also everyday experience of, of just way people talk and way people yeah. think about driving and like people that's kind of you know cultural common sense like you get a license you drive a car like yeah you're, you're not gonna ride a bike kids ride bikes you know and that matches perfectly with people's entire media universe of having that exact message constantly told to them that yes yeah I mean, kids ride bikes adults don't ride bikes like if they do they're weird you don't want to be <laughs> you know like, dude. that's strange and dude that's beautiful that's, yeah you know that's really unfortunate it's like again it's not going to be something where just better representations are going to somehow fix material no no but it plays problems. a role man i like you know a huge role man i mean yeah. i like well, i point to things like um but, but i should say oh. that's just like that's just the stuff that you know 
the big the entertainment industry with like the big e i guess yeah turns out i mean we're also talking about concurrently the same period a real i hate to use the term it's a revolution but i mean yeah a real revolution in terms of people putting out ideas about cycling and creating their own mm-hmm. publications and i mean people and numb tots and all these kinds of things all kinds of stuff yeah and, then, and, and doing things that were like really really funny Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and just like having all these different dimensions to people having conversations and depictions of cycling and like making that cool in an entirely different way. And even if that is just to a a small population at first or maybe ever, it's still bigger than the one that exists. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Good point. Anybody was able to make cycling cool in the United States of America at any point. Uh, is extraordinarily challenging, uh, yeah. especially without the ability just to like ride comfortably in those places, you know. Yeah. So because I'm I'm obsessed with maintenance and repair, um, I unsurprisingly yeah. really liked that your your last two chapters on DIY bike culture and, for example, like community bike projects. Um, because I mean, I think that you know it's an interesting place. Well, there's just there's so much that's fascinating about th- that space for me. But one, it's one place where you see a lot of skill sharing, um, yep. in and which I think is a beautiful thing. And it's also a place where, yeah, where people just have repair skills much more than they do with a lot of objects in their lives. Right? That if they break, it's just like, what the fuck just happened? I need to call sure. somebody. Right? Yeah. So, so where do you see kind of like you know? We've kind of laid out this story. We, there's like at least two tracks. Um, well, yeah. Well, there's a couple tracks. One of them is the rise of like aut- the automobile industrial complex and like automobility and how that becomes such a thing. Then you have this other track that's like the rise of this bicycle counterculture and subcultures and all that kind of that story. So you know, like think put now put the DIY story and the, your last two chapters in that in that kind of tale you've been telling that has a couple of different layers, right? Like, how do you see DIY, like, in 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 that overall narrative you've told? In the technological sense, first of all, there's always been, at least to my knowledge, you know, like, traditions of people forming communities and of, of hobbyists and tinkerers. And yeah, uh, there's some really great stuff that have been written about, you know, that whole culture in... Uh, Ham Radio, mm-hmm. um, Kristen, forget her name, MIT Press book. Yeah. Uh, a great book about like... You know, oh, Christina Dunbar-Hester's book on low power to the people. I would, Yeah, I love that book. That book as well, but this yeah. is a, a different oh, okay. book I believe I was thinking of, but that one's fantastic. Um, but, you know, there's lots of people that you can point to that have documented that, as well as I spent a bunch of time looking through, I didn't get into it very much, but the, the, the technology magazines that were really popular in like the forties and fifties, Yeah, you know, it would be kind of just inventions and, you know, just like lots of like dude shop talk. Um, yeah, yeah. But also everything that swung from like how to advice to pie in the sky ideas about, you know, how technology is going to revolutionize this yeah. or that or the other thing. Um, so there's always been, I think, an interest in people being able to, to do, to do things themselves when it comes to fix it and repair and I do think, if anything, like some of that is informed by by car culture. Lots yeah, of people for have sure. the experience yep. of working on cars and being able. This is pre computers. Yeah, pre computers. Yeah, yeah, being able to do a lot of repairs yourself, yeah. and also having, you know, not having to look very far to find other people that can assist you with that. Somebody's yeah. brother, somebody's aunt, you know, like a local shop, whatever it might be. Um, so I think like some of those attitudes and ideas have always been around since cycling has been popular because a lot of it's out of necessity, you know, people yeah. not having bike shops and so you have to learn how to do some stuff. I mean, like when I started riding, you know, really seriously as a commuter in around, I guess the same years, like 2000, 2001 at the time, there was no, there was no bike shop in between four universities in Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. There was no, there was no bike shop there. So anybody who was like, in my crew of people, you'd stop at this place where our friends worked, and those were like cyclists that that worked yeah. at this like punk shoe store that sold, you know, like Doc Martens and stuff like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, you'd, <laughs> you'd go get your bike worked on there by a friend. You'd be like, "This is making this noise, man. What's going on?" And all yeah. of a sudden, there'd be like this crew of four people around. 
turn, you know, <laughs> flipping it upside down. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The shoes are over there. Sure, sure. And like, just, you know, true in wheels and things. What about um, like bike co-ops and stuff like that, though? Am I wrong? Hugely like, important. Yeah. Hugely important. And I think like for me in particular, those are the, one of the things that I saw is like the most important ways of like building bridges of being parts of communities of doing stuff that's like super practical and really ethical and very yeah. pragmatic and you know just super forward thinking and about like people's relationship to parts and tools and the idea of being able to fix things and the, the practices and habits of doing that stuff um then really focusing on skill sharing and teaching and yeah um and i think that that those places were both a lot of those got started by people that came at cycling from these different places. Uh -huh. Some of them were from folks where their interest in cycling period came from there. Yeah. So you, again, you get these kind of like interesting feedback relationships of, of once you have some institutions, sometimes that's around bike shops. Sometimes it's around, you know, these like uh, community bike programs that take a lot of different guises as well as like really long standing stuff that people have been doing like bikes, not bombs. And I got to credit like, you know, Carl Kerr's, um, and the people in, in Boston who started that and expanded it and really always made the idea of collecting stuff that otherwise would have been pitched um, and to make that available to people. But having that be something where the emphasis is on not just uh, skill sharing, but also things like training, teaching people how to be mechanics and doing so in a way that is also based in like political solidarity, you know, like mm -hmm. they intentionally did things in you know, Nicaragua and in, in, in other countries yeah. around the world and places where there's, you know, spots where they thought it was important to be involved and to do something. And like, we can do this, right. We can bring in, you know, shipping containers of bicycles and train people to be bike mechanics. And, mm -hmm. um, but with a very different end set of goals than some of the programs that I think were really important. And I really like, I'm very nervous in how I dealt with them in my book. Um, because some of them, there's some end of that that shares a lot of the ideas that go along with like the NGO complex, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, treating yeah, everybody yeah. like they're, they're budding yeah, capitalist yeah, yeah. entrepreneurs. Like all yeah, you yeah. need is a bicycle and like you can yeah, cycle yeah. Kill your me, way man. out of Kill me. poverty or something. <laughs> it's like, no. I know. Um, and so yeah. as much as there's some aspects of that, yeah, my interest in addressing some of that was to just like – a lot of it was just me like developing a critique of it. And I, I didn't spend a lot of time with it. It was just like, yeah, that's what I think. And I put it out and I was like, yeah. fuck man, I'm like criticizing bike organizations, you know? Um, but I think for some, some, some valid reasons. And there was yeah. some groups that I had some real ethical problems with, but on sure. the whole, and especially the kinds of stuff that I saw around the country in various places I went with my bands or, you know, anytime my band would travel, I'd find cyclists and interview people or I'd go to community bike shops or bike programs and lots of emails. And is your band on Spotify? A few, a couple of them are. Yeah. I haven't yeah. played in bands in about seven years. Well, six years at this point, but cool, man. Yeah. There's a couple of that up there. I think, uh, I think voice in the wire and maybe Barron's Teddy champs army is up there as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think that they've, they've always been like a really important, core piece of like any semblance of there being like a, a cool and interesting and actually like sustainable bike culture right yeah because they're dealing with something we always have which is a waste stream of stuff that people are going to get rid of oh and yeah, it's yeah, really yeah useful and the other thing that's always there which is people interested in learning how to do things and kids that want bikes and adults that want yeah to learn how to do things cheaply and fix things for themselves and you know, I just think that they're, I think they're really fantastic. And um, well, one I thing, think, um, yeah, one thing that's developed bet between when your book came out and now is like, or at least grown, I feel like is like the YouTube, uh, like fix it culture, you know? And sure. like, so what, do you think that's played a role in this stuff? Definitely. And I think that also this, I was very two minds at the time. This is like in the, what are, the thick of the whole like fixed gear bike bicycling pop. Oh yeah. Fixies. And on the one hand, I hated the way that that got turned into like this, like cool guy status thing. Yeah. Hipster um, stuff. But the reason I got interested in it and I, a lot of people thought it was cool was because it was a way of being like, I don't have to deal with all this stuff. Now I can't fix, you know? Oh, and so, like, I never that even that considered my, that. Side that was it. my interest in it. Like I didn't care about whether I had a, you know, whether I wrote a fixie and, 
learned how to, you know, use my yeah. legs in that kind of way. I just rode a one speed bike, but for me, even though it was hard to learn how to ride hills and stuff on that, you know, if something goes wrong. There's like three things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there's <laughs> yeah. a gear up here, a gear there, and a yeah. chain in the middle. It's like a, it's like a adult BMX bike, right? And all of a sudden, but before that, you know, that's a, if you're somebody who's riding in the city, you get all kinds of, of junk in your chain and your wheels and your wheels. Oh yeah. You know, and, and the ability to not have to deal with these parts on them was, you know, a, a huge factor for me and huh. not having to worry about like, can I get to work? Cause my bike isn't working. It's like, yeah, it always works. It's like, yeah, yeah, solid. yeah. <laughs> you know, if there's something wrong, it's like really wrong. Like I, yeah. can't, ride, I can't ride the thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, like the wheels taco or something, but not because I don't know how to repair a derailleur, which I still don't know how to do <laughs> either front or rear. You know, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> I know it's I know I, I've watched videos and stuff. Dude, no, no, no. I it's yeah. all magic to me. But, you know, it's like, yeah. but those kinds of things I think are those are differences that people advocating that it becomes part of like what makes it's unfortunately what it can be like both real practical but also just like really stylish. Yeah. And unfortunately the the stylish stuff kind of like becomes more prominent or people get hung up on it and yeah, um, you know, and anybody who wants to also make fun of cycling in that period points to that as being just like this this very trendy kind of thing you know like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. fix your bike it's like i've yeah. definitely been that guy yeah i'll, so, I'll so, cop to it yeah and so there's i think that there's aspects of technical culture and diy stuff that can be both like you know the the subculture diy and the technology diy and there was a lot of that also in like you know people building mutant bikes and yeah doing lots of cool experimentation that crosses all these different paths with community bike shops and, and old parts of people that I met that were doing, and some folks that were, were involved with both Bikes Not Bombs and this organization called SESTA in uh, CESEA was the acronym in El Salvador, mm -hmm. um, which was hugely important for a number of people I spoke with that created like uh, a few contraptions. The, the predecessor to the Yuba bike, but like the big cargo bikes, hmm. What's it called? That extra cycle. When okay. I interviewed somebody over there, I think that they had worked down there. This other guy, Aaron, who was making um, bike ambulances in Namibia. Hmm. Uh, I believe he had worked down there as well. He had, he had worked with a number of people that were in the same circles where they were trying to find practical, cheap, uh, affordable ways to create like, uh, you know, I don't know what the word would be. Not necessarily just off-road, but uh, wheelchairs that could be in environments that weren't just perfect concrete, right? Uh -huh. Most of the world sure. is not. And so you have people that got interested in working in these various kinds of projects with, with cycling technologies and, and available parts and yeah. figuring out how you can both cobble certain things together and do new manufacturing to create, you know, really functional kinds of tools for people that are not just about like riding a bike, but can do lots of other things too. And, and, you know, fulfill gaps that people need. And I think, yeah. that, you know, if you don't have spaces where people can like have access to lots of parts and, yeah. and, and tools and all those things, it makes that stuff really difficult. Totally. So man, I knew this was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be fun revisiting this book and talking to you about it. And I really appreciate it, man. What? It's like, I, you know, it's been, it's been a long time since I published it. And I, there's like, a, there's so many good things that I've, you know, that I've read and, and thought about since then. And for a while it was, you know, after I published it, I just like, couldn't think about bikes sure, and cars dude. for a little while yeah um, are you working are you working on anything now or i mean what's what's up now not with that i've been yeah. working on a project for a while uh slowly just from life complications sure also, i've had a kid that then compounded that in, in a great way but uh not great for for working but uh it's about uh, uh israeli punk bands in the 90s and early 2000s and uh, like political punk bands from an interview based project. Cool. Um, How'd you get into that? Cause I was really interested in the fact that even now people's, you know, criticisms of, of the Israeli state and their policies and some of the punk music from that period is still way more radical than most of what you'll hear vocalized 7,000 miles away in the United States. <laughs> That's wild, man. I love you it. Know? And especially yeah. this, the fact that it's from, you know, it's from Israeli Jews and yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, was, when I first started running across some of those bands and zines and other things about that, uh, it certainly perked my ears up, especially the more I was learning about. So you, you know, have you been going over there and interviewing people or how do you do it? 
this was all zoom based or phone yeah sure you know yeah um because at the time too this was like right when i had started doing research and talking to some people but when i was doing the biggest uh stint of interviews was right before covid yeah um and a lot of people that i was talking to were also in different places around the world at this point too that's so cool though man what what a great idea and great way to do it i mean i'm I'm really i just want to do justice to you know people's time that they shared with me and their stories and trying to do something good with it but i haven't done much with you know cycling i mean some of the people whose work i'm a big fan of have you know like uh, Melody Hoffman and Adonia Lugo and Sarah McCullough. I really like Jody Rosen's new book about bicycling. Cool. Um, there's lots of good stuff out there. I don't know, man. I will, I will really look forward to your Israeli punk study because, I mean, I just thought your book was really fucking creative. And, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, man. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Zach. It was an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to checking out more of the podcast and um, definitely reading some more of your stuff as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother, Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy, Juliana Castro, for designing the logos for the podcast. Check out her work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and is supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are hosted in the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the media production manager with Virginia Tech Publishing and serves as producer and sound engineer for Peoples and Things. Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks.